Well, good morning. Welcome to Spring Lake Church in the Nazarene. What a wonderful morning to see all these amazing, beautiful faces. I'm going to try to get through this without crying because I'm a big crybaby, but it's just to see all these faces here, people that have just been so inspirational to my family, and it's just a representation of the love that we have for our pastor and his wife, amen, and his kids. I mean, it's just, it just warms your heart. So I'm going to start out with a joke. It's got an echo. All right, two jokes for you because I like to do jokes. Okay, they're not necessarily good, so I'm going to warn you up front. Okay, uh, what do you call pastors in Germany? German shepherds. (laughs) I like having a crowd. Y'all actually laugh. All right, this is a little long, so I'm going to try to do it slow because I get in trouble for reading too fast. It says, God, one day in heaven, lined up all the married couples in the world in in heaven he could find. He said to the men, my children, I have a task for you all. Those of you who feel that you are the head of the household, step to your left. Those of you who think your wife is the head of the household, step to the right. He gestured to those gathering before him. And to his astonishment, all but one man stepped to the right. God exclaimed, every man here believes his wife is the head of the household? That is a surprise. He turned to the one man who stepped to the left, and he said to him, my child, how is it that you were the only one that ended up in this line? The man looked at God and said, I have no idea. My wife told me to stand here. (laughs) All right. Well, welcome to Spring Lake Church of the Nazarene. Thank you all for coming out and supporting our pastor as he delivers his last service here at Spring. At church. <laughs> uh, we love our pastor. We love his wife and their family. And, and it's just been an a inspiration for these last 30 years. And I know that they've, they've touched your life in one way or another. I'm going to get through the announcements. I'm going to have my beautiful wife come up here to say a few things. Uh, potluck meal there will be a celebration service potluck meal immediately following the service the church is providing the chicken and the drinks Uh, life group two reading through the bible will not meet this sunday at 5 p.m will not meet this sunday at 5 p.m wednesday evening services children's teens and adults groups meet every wednesday at 7 p.m that will continue life group uh, life recovery meets every thursday at 7 p.m um as you all know, that this is Brother Phil and Carrie's last service, which means it's going to be some changes for the church. Um, in the interim, while we prepare for our new pastor, we have to make a few adjustments. Prayer requests, you can call or text Miss Betty Nichols, and she will get the request out on the prayer chain and the email. So um, her number is in the directory, or you can get with her, and she can get you squared away. So that will continue. Uh, Wednesday nights, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, life group one, which is uh, my life group, which we normally meet Sunday after morning service. Uh, we're going to meet 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We will continue our study, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at the Table. Uh, life group two, uh, we'll meet Wednesdays at 5.30 in the activity building. Anyone else who would like to attend Wednesday service, Larry will bring a study and lead prayer as we search for God's will. It's like a new pastor. <laughs> That's going to get me every time I talk about it. Sorry. Um, just an important note, folks, is that at this time of transition, let's not make church an option. All right? Church is a priority. It should be a priority in every single one of our lives. We need our prayer warriors. We need to be encouragement to one another. And we need you to continue your faithful giving. Um, just because our pastor is not here doesn't mean we don't come to church doesn't mean we don't continue to give and support our local church because ministries don't stop just because of one person. If that's the case, then we're in the wrong business, right? We're in the wrong house. You know, when I was in the service, you always try to leave an organization better than the way you found it and that you were set for success when it was time for you to go. And that's the same way with us, but it really starts with the people. We have to have a heart, right? And so make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I want to say thank you for your love and support of Spring Lake, and we love you all. 
At this time, I'm going to have my amazingly beautiful wife come up here, and she's going to bring something special. Good morning. Don't get scared. I have my Bible, but I'm not the fill-in. As church board secretary, I wanted to let the congregation know that next Sunday, um, we're going to start kind of explaining what are our next steps as a church. Um, we will have our district superintendent come and preach next Sunday and then the following, and then we will have an interim pastor already set up that will preach through December. So don't worry. It's all good. God's got this. It's going to be fine. Okay. We are in great hands uh, with um, Pastor Mark Lancaster and um, Pastor Ken Carney. We'll still have a Chris, uh, kids' Christmas program and our banquet because we love to eat. Okay. So it's all going to be fine through the holidays. We just need to be in prayer. But today, it's about our wonderful Stein family. Sometimes as we travel through this world, our lives are touched by someone who makes a profound impact upon us. Someone whose kindness and sense of humanity serves to make days that much brighter. Someone who reminds us of Jesus in his goodness and his capacity to reach out to others. A gentleman who takes the time to extend his hand and open his heart to all those in need. Someone who, like the shepherd, tends to his flock, young and old, with love and devotion. Throughout the years, your family has been by our side. You've celebrated births, weddings, baptisms, graduations. You've shown up for birthday parties, football games, basketball games, dance recital, every other sport, band, choir, piano recital. The list goes on and on. You've shown up to so many hospital visits, they have to know your name by now. You've lovingly guided us through tough times as we face deaths, disappointments, and tragedy. No one could count the hours you've spent praying for us and with us. Your knees must be so tired. A good pastor preaches sermons and guides the church. A great pastor is involved personally and spiritually with each congregate. You have been a great pastor. Thirty years, thirty and a half years is a very long time. It's a very long time to put up with all of us, of course. Though today we may feel like 30 years hasn't been long enough, we know that God is, God is guiding you to a new life. We are excited for this new chapter for you and Carrie, Kristen, Caleb, and Keely. There will never be another family. There will never be another family like y'all. You're very special to us, but today we want to celebrate you. A couple weeks ago, the Lord um, gave me a scripture, and I didn't know why at the time. Um, it meant something totally different. And when I say the Lord gave me the scripture, I mean he opened my Bible to that page. Um, I typically leave my Bible out on the counter um, because, I mean, just being honest, if it's not open and ready for me to read it, sometimes I just don't read it. And when I pass by it, I can read it throughout the day. Um, usually, I am camped out in Psalm because it just is where... My heart is, it's um, just kind of the times that we live in. I love Psalm, but this day, it was turned to Isaiah 43, and I asked Carl, did you use my Bible this morning? He said no, so um, this, that's why I say the Lord gave me this passage, and I want us to listen to what God says. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now, it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So during this time when we feel like maybe we're in the wilderness and we don't know how we're going to get through, we've got to hold to his promises that he will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. He doesn't say a drop of water in the desert. He doesn't say a puddle or a pond. He says rivers in the desert. And that's his water, right, on our dusty, dry, dirty ground. He promises rivers. As Brother Phil um, was sharing with us about resigning, of course, I was super upset. Um, I think Carrie said I was 14 uh, whenever they came, and it's just 
sad and interesting at the same time. Now I have a 14-year-old when they're leaving. But as he was speaking, of course, I was upset. But God kept saying, I'm about to do something new. And it was that scripture he had given me earlier in the week. I'm about to do something new. I'm about to do something new. Like he was patting me on the head. I will make rivers in the desert. God wants to do something new for Phil and Carrie and for us. While we may look at this inward and worry about what does our new look like, what are our, how are our lives going to be changed, let's not forget their lives are about to look completely different than they have for 30 years. Let's be diligent in our prayers for them, their wilderness and their desert. They need our, pra- our prayers and support past this point. I encourage you to call or text them, write them, because we're still family. Nothing I can say is enough. Can never do justice to your years of service. We love y'all so much. Your children have been an absolute blessing to us. You've raised them well. Thank you for your years of devotion to us and to the Lord and to his church. Please come forward. We have you a present. So this picture really spoke to um, several of us that were coming up with what to to do for you. Um, It is a great reminder that Christ is um, our shepherd and that how much he loves us individually and he chases after us individually. He leaves the 99 for one, right? It also reminded me of you both because there are many times quite literally you have chased us down in the parking lot and to check on us to see how we're doing to pray with us to pray for us Um, so you have represented Christ in this church so well and we're so grateful for that we also have a journal sorry I keep sniffing in the microphone we also have a journal You said you like to journal. We have a journal for you with the same picture. And then Carrie has some presents in there as well. Uh, We learned that Carrie likes horses, and that brings her peace. And so we have um, a present that um, we just want you to have peace moving forward. There's cards in here as well. And there's also a love offering. I love y'all. And then if y'all have a seat, do we have a slideshow? Y'all have a seat, we have a slideshow. Um, there's a slideshow with tons of pictures over the year. It is impossible to um, find every picture from every year. Um, but there are uh, lots of pictures for us to look at. And then there's even more in the activity building.
today we're here to worship the Lord most of all and that's what we're going to do and thank you to the praise team they sang two of my favorite songs there the goodness of God and holy 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 um, at this time I think I think Caleb wanted to share something with you we regret Kristen she came last Sunday she could not be with us this Sunday She's actually in New York at this time at the New York Marathon. And uh, no, she's not running it. <laughs> she's with a friend, but she's there. But, uh, but Caleb wanted, uh, wanted to share with you. Closing, not opening. Oh. <laughs> um, I don't have like a big speech prepared today. I uh, just thought it would be something that I needed to do. It's really great to see everybody who came in today. Um, lots of various stages of my life um, sitting in this room today. Um, you know, me and Keely moved to Chicago a couple months ago. And while, you know, we were sad that we weren't going to be seeing people as often, you know, we still knew that, you know, mom and dad would be here and still get to see all you guys. But, you know, pretty shortly you realize that's taken away. Um, Y'all have been a good family to us. Um, Um... yeah, that's really all I can say is, you know, usually sometimes uh, life for a pastor's kid can be pretty tough. Um, sometimes standards are held pretty high, so I want to thank all of y'all for not holding this uh, hooligan up to those standards. Um, but, you know, as Sarah said, there's no words to describe what, you know, my dad and our family means to them. There's really no words to describe what this church has meant to us. So I just want to say thank y'all and love all of y'all. Thank you, Dave. You know, the, uh, the best part of being a pastor is the relationships you build with people especially those that really let you be part of their lives, let you, let you minister to them in a way that um, uh, just seeing them grow in Christ, and many of you have given me that honor and privilege, and I thank you for that. Um, and it, uh, I, I just thank the Lord for what's been accomplished here. Many of you have, have been a part of our lives, and uh, though... Um, though um, 
We, we will not be seeing each other every Sunday. <laughs> we're still part of the family of God. And as I, I told people, we're not saying goodbye today. We're just saying see you later. And that, that uh, means some of you, hopefully I will see you later. Hopefully we will see you again. But if not here, uh, I pray I see you in the presence of the Lord Jesus, our King and Savior. And uh, that will be the rejoicing. That will be, I, I can, uh, you know, that's what we're here for, is to help each other make it to the finish line and be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And though uh, I know there's no sorrow in heaven, you better be there or you're going to have one upset pastor. It has been an honor to, to be your pastor. And I, I want to tell you something very important. I followed a pastor that had been here 19 years. It's very hard to follow a long-term pastor, but you took me in and you loved me, and, and uh, we came to love each other to where now it's hard to say goodbye. Your next pastor, whoever he or she may be, Love them the way you loved us. Accept them the way you accepted us. And you're going to have a great pastor to minister to you also. God already knows who that is. And he's preparing them. So take them in. Love them. And accept them just like you did us. And uh, our prayers are with you. Well... Jim Hill was a young man. He studied to be a professional singer. He even auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera. But thankfully for us, uh, he decided that he was going to sing for the kingdom of God instead. And he dedicated his life to gospel music. In the early 1950s, he wrote a song entitled, What a Day That Will Be. And the story goes that his mother-in-law had fallen very gravely ill. And while he, while he was driving home from work one day, he was praying to the Lord about the situation and asking him why it was happening. And all of a sudden, these words just came to him. And he, he uh, got out of the car and grabbed a piece of cardboard, of all things, and just started writing the words down. And that song has been a source of great comfort and its inspiration to so many over the years. What a day that will be when we are in the presence of Jesus, when we are in heaven. What a day that will be. And uh, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And friends, this is for earth as well as heaven. But it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church body. Thank you for our friends that have come uh, to, to celebrate with us today and to, to say, see you again. But Lord, our goal is heaven. What a day that will be. And I pray, just keep us on track, inspire us with your word this morning. Amen. When I was a freshman in high school, I, I, was, uh, I wasn't uh, very heavy. Let's just say I was about 76 pounds. <laughs> and uh, our physical class... Uh, our PE class, uh, we had an instructor that came out of the military and he taught us a lot of the things that I think the guys had to go through boot camp with. But he toughened us up and at the end of the year, he, he would run us through a drill. We had to, to uh, oh, it was a, a, a course that you had to run through and he would time us. And it, it was where you'd climb the big rope and, and uh, speed test and everything. And, and I had learned that I was, I was, even though I was one of the small guy, smallest guys in the class, that I was good at it. 
And, and, and I was beating some of the, the guys on the football team. And at the end of the class, he said, okay, here's how you get your grades. Those that get this speed get an A. And he made it almost impossible to make. And those that get this speed get a B. And those that get this speed get a C. And uh, I, I determined I'm going to get an A. I am going to get that almost impossible mark he set for an A. And I'll never forget, I took off and it was going good. And I scooted up that rope and, and uh, ran, I, f I forget how many bleachers we had to run. And I was going, it was, I think it was two minutes and 30 seconds we had to do it in. And, but I was getting tired after the minute and a half mark. Oh, I was getting tired. And then when it got to the two-minute mark, I, my legs felt so heavy. I was pushing myself so far. And I'll never forget, the last part of the race was uh, about a 20-step um, going up the benches. And then that was the finish line. And I was so tired. And in my mind, my clock was going and it said, it's already gone past two minutes and 30 seconds. And to this day, I remember at the end of those steps just stopping and gasping for air because I thought I hadn't made it. And then I went ahead and ran up the steps. And my coach looked at me and he said, two minutes and 32 seconds. If I had not stopped, I would have made it. I'd made it. Now, I know that's not talking about getting to heaven, but friends, a lot of people right now are at the stairway to heaven, but they've stopped. And their life is going a lot of other directions, but they're not centered on the goal. They've forgotten the goal. The goal is to make it to heaven, to be in the presence of Jesus. And you can stop. And friends, sometimes people stop and they don't keep going. And that's something I do not want to have happen to any of us. I just want to remind you there's a finish line. The finish line is heaven. And don't you dare stop at the bottom steps of heaven and say, it's not worth it. It's just too hard. This world's a mess. Everybody else is doing their own thing. Why can't I? Don't you dare stop at the bottom of the steps. I want to remind you of the words of the Apostle Paul. He caught a glimpse of the shoreline when he was, uh, and he wrote these words. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now, he's talking about the finish line. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see, Paul was coming to the end of his life. He knew he was there in Rome. In fact, uh, Keith was just telling me, that, where are you at? They, they just came from Rome and saw where they had Paul in prison. Paul knew he might be dying anytime soon because of his faith. And he knew that his time was short, but he said, it's worth it. It's worth it if I die because of what happens when I cross that finish line and I'm in the presence of Jesus. I want to remind you of what we have awaiting us and what's going to make it worth it to go against the world, to, to say, yes, it takes time, it takes giving my time, my gifts, my talents, and my energy to the Lord, but it's going to be worth it. And here's why. Because heaven's real. You see, heaven is a pertinent place. That means it's a real place. It's not something just of fiction. It is real. And friends, it is eternal. 
again, Paul wrote, There is now in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, that's, that's you, that's me, who have longed for his appearing. I don't know about you, I'm longing for his appearing. I wouldn't be surprised if it's coming very quickly. Heaven is our finish line. It's real. One of these days, we are all going to cross over from this land into eternity. I pray you cross over into glory land. And I pray you receive the crown of righteousness but friends, just as there is a heaven, there's a hell. There is a hell. And wouldn't it be terrible to, to, to come to the very edge of the steps and, and making that final journey, and it's the toughest part. Your, your, your faith has been tested. Maybe you've gone through some real losses in your life, and it's difficult, and you're just wondering, wouldn't it be terrible to give up at the steps and not make the extra effort and then find yourself in eternity in hell. I don't want that to happen to anyone here this morning. Heaven is real. The finish line's just in sight for all of us. Stay faithful. Secondly, heaven is a prepared place. There's nothing more beautiful, and, and uh, I, for those that have an opportunity to build their own homes, they're able to, to dream and be able to say, this is what we want here and there, and, and you're able to prepare the place the way you want it. But there's a prepared place for me. I may never be able to build a house, but I've got, I've got something better coming, and so do you. You see, we have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He's preparing a place for us. <laughs> and it's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen on this earth. And it's for all those. Uh, oh, I love this passage of Scripture. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My, in my Father's house are many mansions, is how the King James Version puts it. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? <laughs> Jesus is preparing a place for us. You know, the Bible tells us the New Jerusalem's dimensions. Uh, the city's exact dimensions are measured by an angel and reported to be 12,000 stadia. Now, I know you know what 12,000 stadia is, don't you? <laughs> but we've studied enough. You know it means 1,400 miles in length, in width, and height. 1,400 miles. And even those, the, the, those proportions may be symbolic. That doesn't mean they're not literal. In fact, Scripture emphasizes in Revelation that these dimensions are given specifically in human measurement. Can you imagine the great city of Jerusalem? 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. In, in fact, uh, that, that's a metropolis of metropolises. And not only is Jesus preparing the places for us there, but heaven is a perfect people. Heaven is a place prepared by God for God's faithful children, and it's a perfect place. Listen to Scripture. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God is now among his people. 
He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down for what I say is trustworthy and true. Can you imagine living in a place with no sea? You know, in this life, a sea represents division. It's a, it's a separation. It's a separation of nations and people. But that will never be the case in heaven. In heaven, there will be no more separation and no more storms. We, we then find the Lord stepping up and banning our most vicious enemies. Satan, death, sickness. No more. Sin, no more. They're banished. We'll never experience them again. Wouldn't you like to live in a world like that forever and ever and ever? That's the finish line. Isn't that going to be something worth it to make? Heaven is going to be a phenomenal place. You know, we re we've read this, this verse often about heaven. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And you know, when, when John was describing us, his vision, the best he could of what he saw, he wasn't just throwing out some random descriptive terms. In the early parts of the chapter... He's given a rod to measure out the city. That's very specific. And he specifically describes the wall of heaven as being comprised of jasper and the, the city itself also of gold. He, he describes the foundations of the city walls being comprised of very precious stones and jewels so with those specifics in mind, the description of golden streets makes perfect sense along with the rest of John's eyewitness description. The gold that John saw in heaven is of such quality that it's transparent in order to reflect the pure light of God's blazing glory. And God's ability to purify is not confined to gold. gold. God has purified all who will enter heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Our hearts can be purified by Christ. It, 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 just thinking of the finish line, what heaven's going to be like, it, it reminds me of when the Queen of Sheba went to visit Solomon. She wanted to see his splendor and, and to see the wisdom of his kingdom. And do you remember what her expression was, what she saw when she actually arrived? Scripture says in 1 Kings 10, 7, this was her words, I didn't believe what was said until I arrived and I saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of it. Even she could not believe what she saw. Solomon's kingdom was so full of gold that Scripture tells us nothing was made from silver. For silver was counted as nothing in the days of Solomon. Imagine that. That sounds impossible to us today, but that's... That's what was taking place then. And if that's on earth, what's it going to be like in heaven? The grandest earthly beauty that you can 
uh, imagine, even if I use the most colorful of words, cannot describe what we are going to experience. And we will indeed say, we had not heard the half of it. Heaven is a purchase place. God created this world in absolute perfection. But Satan came and deceived Adam and Eve. They willingly sinned. And the world has been under the grip of sin ever since. But Jesus made a way for us to try to dwell in heaven through his crucifixion and his resurrection. And you say, is it worth it to go through what it takes to make it to the finish line? Well, let me tell you this. Jesus thought it was so much worth it that he did die on the cross for you. And he was resurrected from the dead so you could experience it. Don't you think if God thought it was that important, it's going to be out of this world? You bet it's worth it. No matter what you have to go through, no matter how difficult it may become on this earth to worship Christ in the days of head, it will be worth it. Heaven will be a precious place. You know why? Because of the people that we will find there. Some of you have been longing to see some loved ones that have made it through the finish line. They're waiting on you. And heaven will be heaven because of those loved ones that we're going to be reunited with. And maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe a child, maybe a relative or, or even a friend. But what a day that will be when you get to see them again. But all those things that I've just mentioned are well and good. They're even glorious. But the greatest and grandest part of heaven will be God himself. Heaven will be awesome. Streets of gold, that beautiful river, all of the, the trees bearing fruit. But none of these things will be worth discussing because of Christ himself. One of these days, I pray that everyone here this morning and all that are listening will see him face to face. You know, we, we don't know exactly how all things will be in heaven, but we do know that Christ said, we will be like him. Wow, that's amazing. You know, as we close, I, 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 I want us to, I want us to do uh, bow our heads right where we are. And I think what I'd like us to do is I'm going to pray a prayer. And if this is spoken to you and you realize, you know, I, I, I haven't kept my eye on the finish line. I, I have let other things distract me. And this has reminded me the most important thing in the world is not the things of this earth. It is the things to come and making it to the finish line with Christ. If that's you, I, I just invite you to pray with me. Uh, you can do it silently, but we're going to pray and ask God to make us faithful to the end and make it to the finish line. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this great group of people they are my friends they are my brothers and sisters in Christ we've journeyed together a long time and thank you for that privilege but Lord the most important thing is that we not grow weary of well-doing 
but that we remain faithful to the end, that we not let Satan deceive us as he deceived Adam and Eve. So, Lord, as we live in this, this world where we have great concerns, just keep our eyes on the finish line. Remind us of what's most important. And God, thank you that we can pray a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I've gotten my eyes off of you. I may not even make it to the finish line if I don't change the way I'm living. I ask you to cleanse and forgive me of my sins. I pray, Lord, that you would reignite and renew the joy of my salvation within my heart. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that I and my family will cross the finish line strong and will be together with you in heaven forever. Oh God, we pray this in your most precious name. Amen. There's a, I, I do have, a, I'd like us to all to stand and I want us to sing together what a day that will be. And that's going to be our closing. And remember, what a day that will be when we're all together in the presence of Christ. And, and then, I don't know what all they had planned, but I would love to have everybody gather on the platform and we get a picture. I'd like to have that for keepsake. But let's sing this and sing it with heart because what a day it will be. Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day to the task of expressing how blessed we feel this day as we come together for worship. Uh, we look around and we see people who share our faith and who have shared our joys and sorrows. We look at the cross and we see a symbol of your commitment to our salvation and your amazing, amazing grace. We look in the Bible and we see that we were yet sinners. Christ died for us and that you search for us when we are lost and that you celebrate with the angels when we are found. Help us, Lord, find ways to express our gratitude to you and to others. Help us bless the world with our words and deeds. Help us share the gospel of your love and welcome those who respond to it. Lord, thank you that we are a family in Christ. And now may the Lord truly bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen. Amen. I really would love to get a group picture. I, I don't know. It's going to be hectic. I know. Just come on up here, please. That